This evening, we're continuing our overview of the Old Testament book titled 2 Samuel. But before we examine the events that are found here in 2 Samuel 18, I should take a moment to put our text back into its context, and so it'll help you to remember that David's third son, his name was Absalom, he was guilty of leading an insurrection against his father, and as a result, David decided to lead his family and his friends out of the promised land and to the fortified city of Mahanaim, which was located in Ammon. In Ammon. And it was there where the Ammonites, those who were loyal to David, they provided them with all of the supplies that they needed. And, and now here we are in our text tonight, and we find David. Now he's, he's now preparing his people for the inevitable attack of the enemy. And as we make our way through this chapter, we're also going to consider the importance of becoming those believers who are ready, who are prepared for the attack of the enemy. And the reason why I say this is due to the fact that our adversary, the devil, and his demons, they're constantly looking for an opportunity to attack. The devil walks about like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour, and therefore we must always be ready to resist him by remaining steadfast in our faith that we've placed in Christ Jesus. Well, with this as our focus, let's consider the way that David began to prepare the people for the attack of the enemy. And if you would look with me there at 2 Samuel chapter 18, we'll begin our study at verse 1. Here we learn that David numbered the people who were with him and set captains of thousands and captains of hundreds over them. Then David sent out one-third of the people under the hand of Joab, one-third under the hand of Abishai, the son of Zeruiah, Joab's brother, and one-third under the hand of Ittai the Gittite. And the king said to the people, I also will surely go out with you myself. But the people answered, You shall not go out. For if we flee away, they will not care about us. Nor if half of us die, will they care about us. But you are worth 10,000 of us now. For you are now more help to us in the city. Then the king said to them, Whatever seems best to you, I will do. So the king stood beside the gate, and all the people went out by hundreds and by thousands. Now here in the opening verses of this chapter, we find David. He's counting the men who were with him. He wanted to get a grasp on, on how many had followed him out of the promised land. And, and he wanted to organize his military through division and through delegation. He began by dividing his men into three main divisions, and, and then he appointed leaders within those divisions. Uh, as a matter of fact, look again there at verse 1. Here we learn that David set captains of thousands and captains of hundreds over them. He's establishing ranks of leaders within these three divisions of soldiers. And based on this, we can see then that David was a man who readily recognized the importance of delegating responsibility. He wasn't just out there trying to, to be the leader and, and, and go and direct thousands of men all, all on the battlefield. No, he set up this structure, this hierarchy of leadership so that they could win this battle. And after dividing his men into these three divisions, David then announced that he was going to lead them into battle. However, the people insisted that, that, that David should remain somewhere safe. As a matter of fact, look again there at verse 3. There the people declared, you shall not go out, for if we flee away, they will not care about us, nor if half of us die, will they care about us. Simply put, well, David had a huge target on his back. The only person that they really want to kill here is David. And as, as a result, uh, the men who were following Absalom, uh, they were doing everything that they could to find David and kill him so that they could just put an end to his reign. They could put an end to his claim to the throne if he's dead. David's men also realized that their only hope was in keeping David alive. You, you see, they uh, took a stand against Absalom. And, and if Absalom remained king there in Israel, well, they could never return back to the promised land. Not, a, not until at least Absalom was dead. And so they understood that their only hope for being restored back to their own inheritance, their only hope for returning to the land of Israel, was to make sure that David remained alive and able to resume his role as king. It's for this reason that the people declared, you are worth 10,000 of us now, for you are now more help to us in the city. It's not that they're saying that, oh, you're more valuable than any person, but, but rather they're saying, hey, you're our, our only hope for going back to our families. You're our only hope for, for returning to the land. 
based on this, we can see that those who were following David were fully aware of the fact that David was the only one who was able to lead them back to their inheritance. Therefore, they, they wanted to make sure that he was safe and secure there in Mahane. Now, I'm going to guess that it was tough for David to receive this counsel. I'm going to guess that, that he was ready to just go out and fight this battle. It, it was probably tough for him to stand there at the gate of the city and watch his men heading off to war. And yet I believe that David humbly realized that they were right. I believe that in all humility, he realized that every leader has their place. And therefore he knew that his place, well, it was right there at the gate of the city. The reason why is because the knowledge of his safety would strengthen his soldiers on the battlefield. As long as they knew that David was safe, they had something to fight for. And so he knew that the best motivation that he could provide to them is to let them know that he is safe and sound there in the city. This would fill the hearts of his men with the hope of victory. And not only that, but David also gave them courage by providing them with a post-victory protocol, a, a decision that they needed to make after the fact, after the victory was won. In order to explain what I mean, if you would look with me there at verse 5. Here we learn that the king had commanded Joab, Abishai, and Ittai, saying, Deal gently for my sake with the young man Absalom. And all the people heard when the king gave all the captain's orders concerning Absalom. Now here in this verse we find David, he's giving his men explicit instructions regarding the, the treatment of his rebellious son Absalom. And not only was David encouraging his men to handle his son with kid gloves, but he was also filling their hearts with courage as he refers to their victory as if it were already a done deal. He's saying, hey, when you win this battle, and you will, go, go easy on Absalom. Imagine the confident hope that, that filled the hearts of those men as David presented them with this plan for how they should handle their victory and how they should handle Absalom after they defeated his army. Well, after preparing for them for this victory through the delegation of leadership as well as through the inspiration of encouragement, they went out and actually defeated their enemy. And with this in mind, if you would look with me there beginning at verse 6, here we learn that the people went out into the field of battle against Israel, and the battle was in the woods of Ephraim. The people of Israel were overthrown there before the servants of David, and a great slaughter of 20,000 took place there that day. For the battle there was scattered over the face of the whole countryside, and the woods devoured more people that day than the sword devoured. Now here in these verses, we learn that the people of Israel, they were soundly defeated by the servants of David. And while we don't know how large David's army actually was, we know for certain that it was much, much smaller than the entire army of Israel. I'm going to guess that there were fewer people in David's army than men died from Absalom's army. 20,000 of his men died. And I'm guessing they, they didn't have 20,000 in their army on David's side. Thankfully for them, the servants of David, they were led into this victory because they were all fulfilling their roles and responsibilities according to the delegation of David and according to the leadership structure that, that he created. It was working like a well-oiled machine and, and, and partially because David was a man who organized these, uh, these, these soldiers in, in a right way. And, and, and in similar fashion, I believe that we too can walk in the victory of our king uh, by plugging into our own Christian community and serving according to the, to the structure of leadership. As we embrace the structure of leadership that the Lord has established, we begin to gain the victory over the enemy in our own lives as, as we become this band of believers who are fighting the good fight of faith together. You see, the Christian who's attempting to do it on their own, the, the, the Christian who is the lone wolf, the lone ranger, the the, the one who thinks that they've got it all by themselves, well, that's the Christian that typically gets picked off. That's the Christian that typically gets devoured by the devil and, and, and pulled back into sin. And as we consider the example of those who are serving David here, we see how the Lord, he's able to give us the victory, uh, and, and, he, and he does this through the structure of leadership. He does this by bringing us together as a band of believers, serving one another, engaging in discipleship so that we can be equipped and prepared to fight the good fight of faith. And, and then when we find ourselves in this sort of structure, in, in, in this sort of leadership, well, the Lord then provides also supernatural assistance. As a matter of fact, if you would look with me again there at verse 8. There we learn that the battle there was scattered over the face of the whole countryside, and the woods devoured more people that day than the sword devoured. 
Uh, can you imagine, you know, you know just the, the trees coming alive and eating, eating people? That would, that, would, that would be really strange. But I don't think that's what we're talking about here. Uh, we're, not, we're not talking about Lord of the Rings or something like that. The Jewish historian Josephus commented on this text, and he points out that there were more slain fleeing than fighting. And perhaps some might perish by wild beasts. The Jewish Targum agrees by telling us that the beasts of the woods slew more of the people than were slain by the sword. And so it appeared to me that, uh, you know, these men were being slaughtered by wild animals out there in the woods. God was using the wild beasts of the woods to provide the servants of David with additional manpower, if you would. He was providing them with supernatural help. Now, I'm going to guess that the army of Absalom was expecting a completely different outcome. They had the numbers on their side, you know, they, they were just filled with, with, with energy to, to, to defeat David and his army, and, and they, they probably imagined that they would have an easy victory. They probably believed that they would also be richly rewarded after helping Absalom to overthrow the, the throne of, of his father, David. Sadly, though, they were sore, sorely disappointed as they discovered that the Lord was actually rewarding their unrighteous rebellion with a decisive defeat. We should also notice that Absalom ended up being captured uh, in his own vanity. And with this in mind, if you would look with me there at verse 9, because here we learn that Absalom met the servants of David. Absalom rode on a mule. The mule went under the thick boughs of a great terebinth tree, and his head, caught, uh, his head caught in the terebinth. So he was left hanging between heaven and earth. And the mule which was under him went on. Now, as we read this text, it, it kind of sounds to me like Absalom's cranium got caught in the branches of this tree and the mule just kept on going. But the NLT and the NIV cleared up a little bit by informing us that it was actually Absalom's hair uh, which was caught in the thick boughs of the great terebinth tree. Now, listen, if you're an outdoorsy person, then you know how easy it is to find yourself trapped by the very nature that you went out to explore. It's easy to, easy to find yourself stuck in, in a situation just because... Uh, you know, it can be hard to hike around. It was actually a few months ago, I was mountain biking on this newly cut trail here in South Austin, and I was going probably way too fast through this section of really thick trees, and, and I was so busy looking at the ground in front of the bike that I failed to see there, there, there was a low-hanging branch. Thankfully, the Lord saw fit to take my thick, luxurious hair several years ago. So I didn't get caught in the, the branches of this tree. My head just bounced off that branch like a bad check. You know, I just kind of came to a couple seconds later. But, uh, but it's easy. It's easy to just find yourself, you know, just in the wrong situation out in the woods. And, and next thing you know, you're, you're caught. And that's exactly what happened with Absalom here. He's riding his mule, trying to make his escape. And goes underneath a low branch. And his hair is so thick and luxurious that uh, it got caught in the tree. And so let that be a lesson to all you long-haired people here. <laughs> Seriously, though, the vanity of his beauty became the very thing that brought him into bondage here. And in order to explain what I mean, if you would hold your place here in chapter 18, and I want to turn back four chapters to 2 Samuel chapter 14. You see, it's in 2 Samuel chapter 14 where we find a description of Absalom. And as we consider this description, it'll become evident that Absalom was a man who was filled with foolish pride. He was a very vain man indeed. With this in mind, if you would look with me there at 2 Samuel 14, I want to direct your attention to verse 25. Here we read, Now in all Israel there was no one who was praised as much as Absalom for his good looks. This has never been a problem of mine. But for Absalom, it was, it was a huge issue. We learned that from the sole of his foot to the crown of his head, there was no blemish in him. And when he cut the hair of his head, at the end of every year, he cut it because it was heavy on him. When he cut it, he weighed the hair of his head at 200 shekels according to the king's standard. They called this the Fabio standard back then. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> no, they didn't. Huh? But we see here that, that Absalom was this man who was so good looking, he was so stunning, he, he, was, he, he was just a hunk. And he was constantly being praised for his good looks. And with that being the case, it's not difficult to imagine that, well, he had become the prideful prince who truly believed that he deserved anything that he wanted. He probably believed that he deserved his father's throne. 
Unfortunately for him, his vanity ended up becoming the source of his bondage as he found himself caught in a tree by his lovely locks. At the same time, we must not fail to recognize that Absalom's vanity was partially David's fault. In order to explain what I mean by this, let's make our way back to 2 Samuel chapter 18. If you would look with me there, beginning at verse 10, here we learn that a certain man saw it and told Joab and said, I just saw Absalom hanging in a terebinth tree. So Joab said to the man who told him, you just saw him? And why did you not strike him there to the ground? I would have given you 10 shekels of silver and a belt. But the man said to Joab, though I were to receive a thousand shekels of silver in my hand, I would not raise my hand against the king's son. For in our hearing, the king commanded you and Abishai and Ittai, saying, beware lest anyone touch the young man Absalom. Otherwise, I would have dealt falsely against my own life. For there is nothing hidden from the king, and you yourself would have set yourself against me. Now, here in these verses, we find this soldier He's confessing that he refused to lay hands on Absalom because he heard David's instructions. And he, he knew that David had forbidden them from hurting his son. And as we consider the entire story of Absalom, which not only includes the murder of his half-brother, but it also includes his flight from justice in order to escape the, the murder rap, as well as this insurrection against David, there really should be no doubt in our minds here that David was a father who had failed to provide his kids with proper discipline. And, and one reason why, if I have to guess, well, it's due to the fact that he had 20 kids. I mean, how difficult is that? You're, you're the king of Israel. You've got a whole lot on your plate just, just by way of your job. And you've got 20 kids, all of whom need your attention and your discipline. I'm going to guess that he was completely overwhelmed. Another reason for why many parents don't discipline their children, you know, maybe, maybe they've only got one or two, you know, they don't have 20, but, but they don't because they're afraid that they're going to hurt their self-esteem. Well, if I don't praise them every day and, and, and if I constantly correct them, then it might crush them. It might crush their little spirit and, and then they'll grow up uh, thinking that, that they're worthless because they got spanked. They're afraid of this. Other parents are afraid that their kids will end up hating them if they punish them. Well, I don't want to push them away. You know, I'd, I'd hate to, to discipline them and, and, and then they don't want to talk to me anymore. As we consider these very common fears that, that keep parents from providing their kids with the correction that their kids need, it's important to understand that uh, these are the fears of the enemy. This isn't the fear of God. These are the fears of the enemy. The, the enemy uses these fears to keep us from raising our kids according to the biblical standard of truth. In order to prove my point, I want to consider something that David's son Solomon wrote. And, and if you cringe at hearing these verses, then you have to ask yourself, is my understanding of parenting biblical or is it worldly? Consider what Solomon writes in Proverbs chapter 13, verse 24. There he declares, He who spares his rod hates his son, but he who loves him disciplines him promptly. Again, in Proverbs 19, verse 18, Solomon declares, Chasten your son while there is hope, and do not set your heart on his destruction. In Proverbs 22, verse 15, Solomon also adds, Foolishness is bound up in the heart of a child the rod of correction will drive it far from him. Now, if you hate hearing these verses, I would just point out that, you know, the Bible's always right. And the opinions of men, if they don't line up with the scriptures, well, they're wrong. And if you're currently raising kids, I would encourage you to embrace everything the Bible says. Now, now the Bible doesn't talk about hateful, you know, uh, angry, you know, punishment, but rather loving correction. And loving correction at times includes a spanking. Loving correction it definitely includes correction. It includes that setting them straight and telling them what the truth of the matter is. And I'm here to tell you that our kids desperately need loving biblical correction. Please trust me when I tell you that the enemy wants to lead our kids into the bondage of sinful depravity. And it's sad to say that many parents are just sitting back allowing it to happen. Because they don't want to tell their kids, you can't listen to this music, you can't watch that television show, you can't hang out with those people. They don't want to do that for fear of their kids hating them. 
Our kids desperately need parents who are ready to punish them according to the standards of God's holy word. And, and, and listen, if they reject you for that, they're rejecting God's word. Sadly, the wor- world is now filled with people like Absalom, people who were just told their whole life, you're perfect, you're, you never do anything wrong. You're, there's no blemish in you at all. You know, kids are getting trophies for nothing, you know. Participation trophy. Well, that just completely diminishes every other trophy of those who actually won. You know, kids are being told that they did everything right and, and, and half of what they did was wrong. Well, maybe kids need to be told, hey, you know what? You shouldn't go on American Idol because you can't sing. <laughs> These people get up there and try to sing, you know, and the judges are kind of like, has anybody ever told you that you're horrible at this? No, everybody tells me that I'm great. They're lying to you then. Kids need correction. They need instruction. They need proper boundaries. And as as Christians, we ought to be those believers who are bringing our kids to the scriptures to show them what those proper boundaries are because the world's already filled with Absaloms. We don't need more Absaloms. Because listen, Absaloms will eventually find themselves on the receiving end of righteous wrath. And with this in mind, if you would look with me there, we'll pick up our study at verse 14. Here we read, then Joab said, I cannot linger with you. And he took three spears in his hand and thrust them through Absalom's heart while he was still alive in the midst of the terebinth tree. And 10 young men who bore Joab's armor surrounded Absalom and struck and killed him. So Joab blew the trumpet and the people returned from pursuing Israel where Joab held back the people. And they took Absalom and cast him into a large pit in the woods and laid a very large heap of stones over him. Then all Israel fled, everyone to his tent. Here in these verses, we find the death of Absalom, the one who grew up hearing, you're beautiful, you're perfect, you're the best person ever. And and he bought this whole lie, and his vanity led him to believe that he could take anything that he wanted. And at the end of his life, he finds himself hanging from a terebinth tree because of his own vanity and dying a most horrible death. Joab had no problem disobeying David by acting as Absalom's judge, jury, and executioner. And I always like to point out to parents that if you don't discipline your kids, someone is going to someday. If you don't discipline your kids, they will eventually be disciplined by law enforcement, by a boss, someone's eventually going to put them in their place. And it would be better for you to do it with love now than to allow a, an officer to do it later on at the, at, at the end of a gun. Here we find Absalom having no problem disobeying David. And I should take a moment to remind you that Joab was the one who had convinced David to let Absalom return without punishment. Remember, it was back in chapter 14. Joab was the one who talked David into letting Absalom return without facing any punishment for the murder of his half-brother. Joab was the one who hired the crafty woman from Tekoa to trick David into making that decision. And with that being the case, you better believe that Joab felt responsible for Absalom's insurrection. You know that he he was torn up inside about the whole thing because he's the one who talked David into letting his son come back. Well, rather than allowing the the blind kindness of David to result in yet another insurrection, Absalom goes ahead and makes the decision to enact capital punishment according to the law of the Lord. And we know that Absalom deserved capital punishment for everything that he had done. It was at this point in time when the vanity of Absalom became a warning to those who would oppose the anointed king of Israel. As a matter of fact, look with me there at verse 18, because here we read, now Absalom in his lifetime had taken and set up a pillar for himself Shouldn't be surprising. It's in the king's valley. For he said, I have no son to keep my name in remembrance. He called the pillar after his own name. And to this day, it's called Absalom's monument. Here in this verse, we find this monument that Absalom commissioned for his own vain glory. And it's now standing as a reminder that those who oppose the anointed king of Israel will be punished according to the biblical standard of God's law. 
what Absalom meant as uh, an act of glory for himself ended up became, becoming a reminder to every other Israelite that you do not fight against the anointed of God. It's sad to say that there were many who would go on to fail to learn the lesson from that monument of Absalom. As a matter of fact, when we get to chapter 20, we'll learn about an, uh, an, another man named Sheba, and he's going to learn the same lesson, and he's going to learn it the hard way. In similar fashion, listen, I'm here to tell you that those who oppose the King of Kings, Jesus Christ, they will eventually find themselves on the receiving end of his righteous wrath. Those who oppose the Lord's anointed King, those who oppose Jesus, they will find themselves facing the righteous wrath of God. Therefore, every Christian parent would do well to help their kids to submit themselves to Jesus at a young age so that they can avoid the everlasting punishment, which will eventually come upon those who oppose the one who alone can save them from the punishment that we all deserve. Not only that, but we'd also do well to become those believers who are modeling what it means to be submissive believers. We, we would do well to, to help our kids see that we ourselves are submissive to the Lord Jesus Christ. And one way that we can show them that is by becoming submissive within the structure of leadership that the Lord has created here within our fellowship. And with this in mind, if you would look with me there, beginning at verse 19, here we read, Then Ahimaaz, the son of Zadok, said, Let me now run and take the news to the king, how the Lord has avenged him of his enemies. And Joab said to him, you shall not take the news this day, for you shall take the news another day. But today you shall take no news, because the king's son is dead. Then Joab said to the Cushite, go tell the king what you have seen. So the Cushite bowed himself to Joab and ran. Here in these verses, we're reintroduced to Zadok's son, Ahimaaz. And it'll help you to remember that Zadok was one of those high priests who... who was fleeing with David when Absalom's insurrection began, but then David asked him to return to Israel, to return to Jerusalem, so that he could actually spy on Absalom and, and give him the information that he needed. Well, after learning about the military plans of Absalom, Zadok asked his son Ahimaaz to provide David with the important intel that he was waiting for, and that's what Ahimaaz did. He, he had this new ministry to take information from his father out to David. Well, now here in our text tonight, we find him as seeing this opportunity to serve David again in this very same way. And, and so he signs up quickly to, to take David the intel that he's waiting for. And, and, and he was super excited to share the news about their victory over Absalom's army. And yet what he failed to grasp is that this message also included the news of Absalom's death. Rather than sending a him as who had only partial information, Joab descends to send, uh, decides to send this Cushite man who had first-hand information about Absalom's death. This Cushite man was there and, and saw what happened when Absalom died. Well, after this Cushite man was sent, we find him as he's insisting that he be sent as well. He's not taking no for an answer. He's not submitting himself to his leader. And with this in mind, if you would look with me here at verse 22, here we learn that him as the son of Zadok, said again to Joab, but whatever happens, please let me also run after the Cushite. So Joab said, why will you run, my son, since you have no news ready? But whatever happens, he said, let me run. So he said, run, Forrest, run. <laughs> that would be hilarious, wouldn't it? Now he said to him, run. Then him has ran by the way of the plain and outran the Cushite. Now David was sitting between the two gates and the watchman went up to the roof over the gate to the wall lifted up his eyes and looked, and there was a man running alone. Then the watchman cried out and told the king, and the king said, if he is alone, there is news in his mouth. And he came rapidly and drew near. Then the watchman saw another man running, and the watchman called to the gatekeeper and said, there is another man running alone. And the king said, he also brings news. So the watchman said, I think, he, I think the running of the first is like the running of Ahimaaz, the son of Zadok. And the king said, he is a good man and comes with good news. So Ahimaaz called out and said to the king, all is well. Then he bowed down with his face to the earth before the king and said, blessed be the Lord your God who has delivered up the men who raised their hand against the Lord my king. And the king said, is the young man Absalom safe? Ahimaaz answered, when Joab sent the king's servant and me your servant, I saw a great tumult, but I did not know what it was about. And the king said, turn aside and stand here. So he turned aside and stood still. 
Now, here in these verses, we find a him as he's arriving first there in Mahanaim. And while it's true that he was able to outrun the Cushite man, it's also true that he wasn't equipped for the task that he signed up for. And the reason why is due to the fact that he was lacking important information regarding Absalom. He had, he had a passion to accomplish this ministry, but he didn't have the information to fulfill what he signed up for. In light of this, it's important for us to understand that there are times when we ourselves get frustrated with our leaders, and the reason why is because they aren't allowing us to do something that we are passionate about. We want to sign up for this thing that we love. We want to be a part of this thing that we're passionate about, but the leader says, no, no, this is not for you. And we become frustrated with them. We, we don't like to hear the no. But what we fail to recognize is that a person can have great passion for something without having the knowledge necessary for accomplishing what they're passionate about. It's called having zeal without knowledge. And it's something that is very common. It's very common for us to be passionate about something we just don't have enough information to actually do what we're passionate about. At that point in time, it's important for us to go gain the knowledge that we need so that we can actually fulfill our passion. Sadly, though, there are just many Christians who follow in the footsteps of Ahimaaz by just refusing to take a no and taking it upon themselves to go and do what they want to do. It's not long until they find out that they didn't have the knowledge to do what they signed up for. Rather than submitting to the instructions of their leaders, they, they just allow their zeal to override logic and, and, and they, they, they're led in, they lead themselves actually into ministerial failure. And the reason why is because they trust the passion that's in their heart more than they trust the leaders that the Lord has provided them with. Based on this, I would just point out that we need to learn how to accept the counsel of the leaders, especially those who tell us no. I, I meet with the lead deacons of this church and, and I know the hearts of the men who help me to lead this church and, and we don't tell people no because we just want to, you know, destroy your, your day and, and ruin your life and keep you from doing what God's calling you to do. The no's that we, you know, deliver to people in this church aren't meant as punishments, but rather uh, there are times when the Lord is just saying, no, not now, Wait. We would do well to learn how to accept the no's of the leaders who would say no. And we should also rejoice in those whom the Lord chooses to fulfill the ministry that we may have had passion about. Uh, with this in mind, if you would look with me there at verse 31. Here we read, just then the Cushite man came and the Cushite said, there is good news, my Lord, the king, for the Lord has avenged you this day of all those who rose against you. And the king said to the Cushite, is the young man Absalom safe? So the Cushite answered, may the enemies of my lord, the king, and all who rise against you to do harm be like that young man. Then the king was deeply moved and went up to the chamber over the gate and wept. And as he went, he said thus, O oh, my son Absalom, my son, my son Absalom, if only I had died in your place. O oh, Absalom, my son, my son. Now, as we read these final verses, we clearly see the broken heart of a man who probably should have spent a little more time disciplining his son. And we recognize that, I'm sure. But I also want to point out something that's really not mentioned here. Because just a few minutes ago in, in, in verse 30, we saw... Ahimaaz being told to step aside and, and to allow this Cushite man to come in and deliver the news. And so as we read these last three verses, we have to recognize that Ahimaaz is standing right there watching another man do what he was passionate to do. Ahimaaz is standing there watching someone else doing the ministry that he signed up for. And I can imagine that the heart of Ahimaaz was filled with envy, maybe even some anger. If so, then there's no doubt that he was walking in the flesh. And, and, and we see this in the competitive nature of, of how he you know, set out to outrun the Cushite. 
You see, he had become David's trusty news guy. He wasn't about to allow someone else to come in and take that ministry from him. He wasn't about to allow someone else to come in and accomplish this thing that he had been doing. And it was with that passion that he outran the Cushite to arrive first and accomplish nothing. He wanted to accomplish this ministry, but he didn't have the information. So he was told to step aside while somebody else accomplished that ministry. And it's sad to say that I see this happening in the church all the time. People getting competitive about the ministry, competing with one another in the flesh because I want to do this. Well, I want to do that. And why do you get to do this? And rather than rejoicing that the Lord does raise up somebody else to accomplish something that we're passionate about, we get bitter. We get jealous. We become angry with that person because why is the Lord using them and why are they better than me? Listen, the Lord hasn't called us to compete with one another for positions of power. No, instead, he's calling every Christian to walk in wisdom by becoming a functioning member of our church body so that we can fight the good fight of faith together. But what this means is that we have to humbly accept the Lord's calling on our life, whatever it may be. If the Lord is calling you to you know, clean the building and scrub toilets, then, man, that's exactly what the Lord is calling you to do. Don't be jealous because the Lord called somebody else, you know, to, to serve in children's ministry. Whatever the Lord's calling is on our life, that's what we ought to be fulfilling. If, if you're the captain of a thousand or you're ca the captain of, of a hundred or, or, or you're just a soldier on the field, we need to become those believers who humbly just accept whatever the Lord's calling is on our life and become passionate about his calling not competitive with those that we wish we had their calling. But what this means is that we need to take our agendas, we need to take our, our self-serving desires and recognize it for what it is. The self-seeking desires that we have that cause us to become competitive with other believers, it's actually an attack of the enemy. As a matter of fact, I would encourage you to read James 3 for homework, but I just want to share a few verses. James 3, verses 13 through 17, James says this, Who is wise and understanding among you? Let him show by good conduct that his works are done in the meekness of wisdom. But if you have bitter envy and self-seeking in your hearts, do not boast and lie against the truth. This wisdom does not descend from above, but is earthly sensual and demonic for where envy and self-seeking exist confusion and every evil thing are there but the wisdom that is from above is first pure then peaceable gentle willing to yield full of mercy and good fruits without partiality and without hypocrisy based on this I just want to encourage all of us here tonight beginning with myself, that we need to set aside the envy. We need to set aside the self-seeking because all of this is carnal and it's sensual. And at the end of the day, it's really just demonic. We would do better to become those believers who are seeking purity in our lives and, and, and ready to make peace with the people around us and, and gentle with one another, willing to yield to one another. We need to become those believers who are filled with mercy for one another so that we can bear good fruits. We haven't been called to show up to church and, and treat one another with partiality. We we're certainly not called to become Christians who are walking in hypocrisy, but rather we've been called to simply become the part of the body that the Lord wants us to be, to fulfill the calling that he's given to us individually rather than fighting against one another and seeing each other as enemies. Because that's what the devil wants us to do. The devil, if, 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 if the devil and his demons can convince us that we are enemies against one another here, then we're not focusing on the real enemy. And it's a trap. 
If, if the enemy can come in here and disrupt the fellowship of this church so that we're you know, constantly engaging in infighting, then we're really not fighting the good fight of faith. We're just fighting with one another through unforgiveness. And you know, he said this and she said that and my feelings got hurt. And then we allow bitterness and envy and self-seeking and unforgiveness to just control us. It's nothing but a trap of the enemy. That being the case, I encourage you, let's not fight against one another. Let's fight the good fight of faith. And we do this not by trying to claim a ministry that doesn't belong to us, but rather by accepting the ministry that the Lord has for us. Let's look to the Lord to lead us into his perfect will so that then we together can serve our king according to his calling. And as we do this, he supernaturally empowers us to gain the victory over the enemy.